Welcome to the Guest X Podcast, where my co-host Brian Hamawi and I uncover the latest technologies and human-driven initiatives that are raising customer expectations and forever changing how we define customer experience across a host of industries. If you are passionate about creating incredible content and unique experiences, join us as we talk to leading product and experience experts across the globe and learn about how today's most successful brands are setting themselves apart from the competition. Welcome to the Guest X Podcast. Uh, Mr. Hamawi, my co-host, Mr. Guest Experiences, I like to uh, kindly refer to him. You know, I was just thinking to myself, uh, in our intro there, we, we talk about across the globe. And today, probably not further across the globe than we can get. In fact, uh, I'm sitting here late um, in the evening because of the time difference. There is very few hours when we can actually... Have we done one this far far away, Brian? No, this is the furthest we've done. It's yeah. uh, it's pretty exciting. I actually, I looked at my calendar and I said... Oh my God! I've got a race home. I've got a. I've got a. What is it? Seven seven o'clock here. Yeah, seven. Uh, seven. Podcast Eastern. with Matthew Loney. He's lending me his time. Uh, I was. You know, the other thing that's strange is um, I just saw our guest, and we were both in Europe together. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's just it's really cool how across continents now. This industry, social media, I think, plays a big part. Today's guest is just all over social media. You know, if you follow our industry at all, you'll have seen her a million different places on a million different platforms. But um, it, it is really cool to think about how it's enabled successful businesses, successful leaders to get out of their local market, now out of their country, impact in a positive way people's lives across the globe and I think it just continues to say a lot about this industry and I know we take a lot of knocks for still being in our infancy and and I think that's something we ought to own right and just say yeah we've got to get better in our technology but what's really cool is we haven't given up I think that that really personal experience of being a part of this industry is still alive and well. Well, I think one of the things that's happened, especially over COVID, is that we've unified the industry quite a bit. Hmm. Um, and I think it's come through technology. So I don't know if you look at maybe seven, we always use five years as the benchmark. But if you look seven, 10 years back, we really, I mean, when would you have ever thought about reaching to over, over to somebody in, in Europe or Australia or you know any of the Asian markets and say, hey, give me some advice on how to run my short-term rental business? And actually be really well connected and in a lot of instances actually become really good friends. Yep. Now we have the opportunity to host them on podcasts. It's it's wild and all of these people are listening. So I know it is crazy. Know, I, think it it's, is. I think it's time. I think we should introduce our guests. Let's do it. Let's do it. I can't wait. Yeah. So today we have an absolute powerhouse in the vacation rental space. Her name is Julie George. She's the author, author and best-selling of the best-selling book, Million Dollar Host, and co-author of the recently published and best-selling book, Hospitable Hosts. This businesswoman from Australia has built an incredible short-term rental property management company, up to 130 properties, and she was selling in excess of $8 million in just under three years. <laughs> Uh, she recently sold that company and now uh, does a bunch of work in the industry. And if you don't know her, you're about to meet her. Julie, welcome to the show. G'day, g'day from Australia and from the g'day. future too. So I'm one step <laughs> ahead of you boys. And, uh, and I can tell you the future is bright in this industry. Matt, something you were just saying then really resonated in that, you know, how cool is it that we've got this community of people in our industry that comes together to support each other, no matter where we are in the world. And I recognise that just recently, I just did six weeks doing around the globe to uh, England, Spain, um, at the Americas, Fiji, Singapore, like I, I, I kind of went everywhere. And uh, everywhere I went, it felt like a, a school reunion, catching up with industry folk that I'd only ever met on Zoom before, but it's a collaborative industry and folks, if you're listening in for the first time and you're considering getting into short-term rentals, into the hospitality game, do it. It's, uh, you will, you'll be joined by a group of friends and it's um, a very supportive industry where we can hopefully motivate you and inspire you to replicate the same success that we've all seen. 
I think that's really important to, uh, to say because our industry is actually a really small group of very supportive individuals or companies. I mean, you take a person like Will Slickers, Matt, and uh, I know we all have something in common with that guy. Came from the hotel space, super young, and in a year and a half, two years, look how we have adopted him into our industry and what he's done for us as well. Well, um, well let me just tell you, Will Slickers, Will Slickers and I were the first on the dance floor in Nashville and the first on the bucking Bronco in Nashville. So, <laughs> hey, if anybody hasn't connected on my, on my social media, have a look. You'll see Will and I uh, doing some crazy, crazy stuff together. That's awesome. I'm going to take a look. Julie, let's, um, for those guests that don't know who you are, why don't you give us a little bit of a background where you're from? We can start there. How you got started in the space and then what you're doing now. Yeah, absolutely. So my favourite story to tell, of course, Brian, uh, is my own. Um, and look, my claim to fame is that in back in 2016, I had a single property uh, of my own that I owned. Uh, it was fully furnished. Uh, and I decided to find out what all the fuss was about with short-term rentals. So pop the Wi-Fi on, put the linen in, and uh, yeah, and then next minute just discovered what I think all of us have uh, felt in, you know, that it was just such a great guest experience. Uh, the money was terrific. I was able to use my own investment property for the first time ever, um, and that really um, triggered a, an opportunity for me. I was working as a real estate broker at the time in a flat market, Property investors didn't have much of an option and I, I was able to go out to them and say, well, let me put your properties on short-term rental platforms. Uh, let me pop it on Airbnb. I'm going to charge you a small fee and I'm going to run all the logistics for you. Uh, so that very quickly... And I say very quickly, but there's a lot that goes into it. Um, but that turned into a, a portfolio of 130 properties, a property management company. Within the first year, I'd turned over a million dollars. So I got to uh, wow. yeah, write, write the book Million Dollar Host. Um, if I'd waited to the second year, I could have written the multi-million dollar host. But, um, but I loved it so much that we scaled this business up um, and in a very unique manner, which we can talk about shortly but uh but at the um the stage just prior to COVID, i had a knock on my shoulders to say we'd like to buy your business and of course uh that was going to free me up to do more traveling around the world some more speaking gigs and influence more people in the industry so i sold my business just before COVID. i now get to consult i now get to mentor others and um and of course the second book hospitable hosts has just come out and that's gone bestseller around the world uh, with all all profits, all money is going to a charity uh, in the UK. So, um, so it's a pretty wild ride. And if you told me I'd be doing this five years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. But um, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> it is an amazing story. It, you know, uh, if well, if Julie's in America, we'd be saying it's, you know, it's the, it's the American dream, right? It's the American story, but she's not. So we'll say it's the Australian dream and the Australian. But it is, and I think it's one of the things that's drawn people to our industry. I don't think that's unique to vacation. Any industry, I think, when you get in early, right, there's going to be some, re there's, there's greater opportunity. There's also greater risk for those who get in early. But as you look back over that time, and I'm sure you mentioned kind of quickly, because when you're in it, right, it probably does feel like it just went by, you know, um, really, really fast now looking back. But what, what do you feel like, what were the keys, do you think, to your success? I mean, you know, obviously no one's in this industry who doesn't really, it's a hard industry. You have to work hard, but that's not an in and of itself enough, especially I think today. But um, what, I mean, what do you think led to that success? I think you have to be, no matter what business you're starting out in, you've got to be very resilient. Um, a lot of friends and family, will. there's a lot of naysayers out there that will, will, will probably not believe in your dream as much as you do. And one example was uh, the real estate agency I was working for at the time when I came up with this brilliant idea of Airbnb property management. Now, it's not that long ago. It was 2016, but there were not many companies out there doing what, <laughs> a lot of us are doing now. Uh, so as you said, it was I was early days, but I came up with this concept that let's turn uh, these properties into instant hotels. And I went to the, the uh, principal of the real estate agency. And I said, I've got this great idea. Let's start this short-term rental business. He looked at me and he scoffed like I had said, we're going to start a lemonade stand. 
And when he dismissed me, I went straight back to my desk, typed up the resignation letter, threw it at him. And within six months, I'd started this business. I was earning more money than him. I'd poached all of his good staff and, you know, yeah. basically um, <laughs> said, stuff you, buddy. But um, so I think resilience is probably something that I would say, folks, if you've got an idea and you believe in it, follow through and do not let people sway you from that idea because anything is possible. It's just what's up here that limits your imagination. So um, mm. love it. It is really interesting because starting, I, I did the same, you know, started with one property and learned it. Do you think that there's value in the way that you've actually built, you built up the business, um, starting with one property, doing every single, you know, intricacy about the short-term rentals. I find I find that, that there's an advantage to people who didn't just buy into the short-term rental business because it, be, it is a very complicated business and just buying into it, 40, 50 properties and saying, okay, I was a plumber in the UK. Now I've come, I bought a short-term rental business and now I'm a pro professional property manager and they're falling flat on their face. Whereas if somebody like you that says, well, I've got this idea, I'm going to start with one, learn everything I possibly can about it and then start to scale it over a period of time. Do you think that that gave you a head start and advantage over, you know, doing the complete opposite, which, which would be- Yeah, 100%, Brian. I totally believe that that gave me a huge, huge advantage. And, and in fact, remembering one day in particular where I personally had made 17 beds in a row and went home and went, whose stupid idea was this short-term rental business? <laughs> I need to either get my- can I swear on this show? Oh, absolutely. Go for it. Can I get my shit together and yeah. get a team in place and get a framework organised and scale up? Or do I just go and get a job? Like that was the thought process. And to this day, anybody that I would employ in my business, no matter what business it is, I would have them start from the, the bottom, learn the ropes. So in my short-term rental property management business, the employees that I was bringing in as managers towards the end of before I sold, I had them out there making beds, scrubbing toilets. I had them answering those guest messages in the middle of the night, dealing with people locking themselves out. I didn't care. I, if, if people were too precious to do that, uh, I didn't want them on my team. So um, absolutely. And I look at people now, like you said, Brian, that come in and purchase these short-term rental businesses. Oh, man, that's scary. I just yeah. think they're going to crash and burn. It is. It's hard. It's hard to watch them do it. They don't know the operational side, but then, you know, you've got the accounting, you've got all of how to handle the guests. I think one of the things that was valuable for me was understanding what the guests needed and, and wanted out of the house. And that really started at the base of the house. And if I understood that, then building up a company became much easier because I knew the type of staff that I was looking for, the type of communication that they deserved, and then how to implement that, the types of technology. And that's changed significantly even since 2016. So as you start to look back, I mean, 2016 to now, it doesn't seem like an awful lot of time, but what kind of changes have you seen that are just like mind blowing? And how do people start to navigate through some of it without becoming uh, too consumed with technologies and processes and things like that? So this is a really great question. And uh, let me just tell you, 130 properties I was running without any technology. So I was not using a PMS. I didn't have a channel manager. I didn't have pricing software. I had nothing. All I was running was 100% on Airbnb. I had zero for my accounting and I had a real estate software because in Australia we were running trust accounts, so I needed that. That's it. And people to this day look at me and go, how the hell did you do it? Well, I can tell you it was with some very good processes in place. But now I, my biggest regret would be, and I look at what people are doing now, my biggest regret was not using a dynamic pricing tool. Hmm. Um, I now use Price Labs and, yes, Price Labs is not sponsoring me, but they bloody should because I'm about to tell you that without using a pricing dynamic pricing tool, I calculated that I lost over a million dollars in earnings. Wow. And that was 10, 10 to 12% of my revenue because I was guessing. I was thinking, how would anybody in America or in Europe know, and price subs are in India as well, how would they know 
what I should be charging in Australia. Like, how would they know better than me? So my ego, my arrogance came into play and I was like, oh, I'll just guess. What a dickhead uh, for doing that because <laughs> I look back now and go, that was a million dollars that I calculate that I lost. Now, yeah. I have once again started again a little like you, Brian. I think even though we sold our businesses, so you and I have a very similar story, I, it's addictive, right? So I have started again as well now. What I have done differently is I've got a dynamic pricing tool. What I've done differently is looked at getting data and making sure that all my data, like when I was looking for the right property, there's a new company and I'm not sure if people have heard of this company. It's about to launch in the next couple of days, STR Insights, uh, Kenny Bedwell. So he, um, keep an eye out for that company, folks. Um, STR Insights, really impressive. Only in America at the moment, but certainly one that if I could use them here in Australia, I would, but I'm now looking at in the United States for opportunities. I'm using their platform to look for, for deals to be done. I'm not guessing anymore. So it's uh, there's a, I think anybody who's in the business right now has got a huge advantage and you've got these tools, you've got these softwares that are available to you to make your life easy. But here's the disclaimer, automate, don't complicate. Mm-hmm. So automate, don't complicate. There are a lot of shiny objects out there that you do not need. And I look quite often look at we're walking through a few of these conferences over the last six weeks, walking down the aisles of the, the trades, um, you know, the displays, and I'm just thinking, what the hell would I need that for? And why would I spend my money on that? So, folks, don't get swayed. Don't be a sheep with the crowd. Don't get distracted by the shiny objects. Automate, but don't complicate. That brings up a good point because Brian and I, this is a conversation we have a lot is the technology. Have we made it smoother? Are we actually eliminating the, the guest friction? And I think in some cases we have, in some cases though, we've overcomplicated it because we think we, our business needs all of this, right? And, and people forget this, this industry was booming like you, you like you were doing without a lot of this technology. And that doesn't mean it's bad, but you do want to go into it kind of eyes wide open. I mean, when you think about it, Julie, what are the essentials? You've talked about mm. pricing tools. There's obviously it's really two, three, four competitors, you know, kind of out there that are doing a nice job, I would say at an enterprise level. But um, what, what are the other keys that, that you definitely yeah. need? Well, actually, funny you should mention that and the word keys because I totally forgot. So back in 2016 Mm. to 2019, we were doing face-to-face check-ins. Keys, We would make sure that (laughs) that we eyeballed every customer. And for a homeowner, that was really important. They wanted to know that their property manager was taking this job seriously. And we were just, we were making sure that if anyone was walking in with a boombox, keg of beer, we were onto them. Uh, now, the change that I have made, the other essential that I have put in is um, it's called, it's Enzo Connect and it's called a boarding pass. And what it does is that it's for self entry. Now, I've got somebody checking in today. So we have text a, um, a you. URL link. God, I'm hopeless with tech guys. Sorry. No, so, <laughs> the, the, but we have sent this boarding pass out to them. Now the boarding pass will actually not only give them the check-in instructions, but show photos, show videos, show exactly where the pin pad is, how to unlock the smart lock, uh, how to enter the parking garage. So that to me, so, so to be honest, the essentials for me would be that pricing, dynamic pricing tool. I don't care which one you use, folks. Just use something. You get the experts on board for that. Enzo Connect boarding pass. I just think that they're amazing and it's free um, as well. Um, but that's, you know, there, there will be other add-ons eventually, but I love those guys. And it also mixes in the guest experience. It tells people what is locally, uh, helps you order food. It helps you show you where the restaurants are. Hmm. Um but, uh, but I, I'm going to tell you again, I'm 100% Airbnb and I would look at direct bookings for return visitors, but I'm not actually, I'm not using a PMS. So I'm going against okay. the grain here because yeah. I don't know that I need, well, I don't need it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, look, I think, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I think that's, I think it's good for people to hear, Brian, that, that there are people, you know, building these companies that have built them. Um, from the standpoint of, you know, uh, 
my distribution are the OTAs and mm -hmm. I've built it into my pricing model. I've built that cost into my P and L and um, you know, that's just, that's how I'm going to kind of book, you know, uh, build my business. It is really interesting though, that, that you mentioned that. Cause I think a lot of, I was expecting PMS to be right up there with locks and, um, no. and pricing tool, but yeah, so that's, that's really interesting. People, people, um, People feel like they need to be on multiple OTAs. Look, if Airbnb is providing me all the guests that I need and I'm getting direct bookings to fill the gaps, why do I need to be on booking.com or, uh, you know, the other channels that I don't particularly love um, and I'm putting it out there right now? I haven't had great experiences with them, so I don't really want to use them. And Airbnb, Brian Teske probably needs to sponsor my facial tattoo that I'm going to get off his logo. Uh, but um, <laughs> But I just feel that, if they have got their reciprocal reviews in place, which I just think is the, the key to the having a good guest experience, the reciprocal reviews are there, the host guarantees there, they are the marketing machine that brings in the work for me. I don't need to go anywhere else. So I'm going to keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid is my philosophy. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things, Matt, is which is we talk about this a lot is understanding your brand, understanding your customer. And I think one of the things that Julie's understood really well is who her customer base is and who she's trying to target. And it feels like even though she's not using a PMS, she knows how to target those guests. One of the things for me, especially in the market that I'm in, is you know I don't have the ability to just use Airbnb because we're such a competitive market. We, we have 40,000 vacation rentals. We're all competing against those guys. I have to broaden my my reach to different prospects i also have to be able to because of that we also know that the technology that we need to use needs to be a little bit more complex right because i'm not going to manage a vrbo airbnb booking.com and then all the whole series or the whole gamut of other uh distribution channels that we have so i think the difference is really understanding how you want to build your company and then implementing the things that you need to implement so that it grows the right way. So Julie knows exactly, and it's by, you know, it's not, it's not by default. She understands exactly what she's doing. But I think one of the things to scale, to scale your company is, A, you have to understand your brand. You need to understand your customer base. And then in order to be able to do that, you need to then take a look at your technology platforms and see if you can achieve those goals with what you have around you. When you uh, consult with your companies, do you consult and say, okay, you don't need a PMS and you just need to do distribution? Or is it more based around the company's infrastructure, where they're located and the reach that they have to be able to compete in the local market? Yes, spot on, Brian. It, it's very independent um, of their location, their market. Uh, so we're really fortunate in Australia uh, where I've got my properties. Um, uh, yeah, Airbnb is all over it. So uh, so I was very fortunate. I just could use them. Uh, but the majority of the people that I am working with in North America, uh, they do have two or three OTAs that they're working with, they do have PMSs. So for the PMS side of things, um, I can tell you which ones are my favourites. Uh, <laughs> I, I do love Guesty. I, I think Guesty is one of the top providers, but also one of the most expensive. Uh, but you do get what you pay for. So Guesty, Guesty for hosts, uh, which was formerly your port up, um, Love it. Uh, hostfully, hostfully, have got you know fantastic um, mix with their guidebooks as well. Uh, so they're probably the top, uh, the top ones that I see performing really well that people love and are getting really good results from. Uh, so yeah, PMS is really important, but I think you've got it's. There's a lot of room for PMSs to do better <laughs> in mm -hmm. our industry. And the one big piece of the puzzle that I see that is missing and, P and any PMS companies listening in to us right now, property management software, uh, include something to do with trust accounting. Mm -hmm. Trust accounting, certainly in Australia, in certain areas of the United States, we have to provide these audit reports on a regular basis. We have to have these particular, you know, um, accounting procedures that we need to do in our short-term rental businesses 
that property management software just is not aligning with at the moment. Yeah. So as soon as someone figures out that piece of the puzzle, I can tell you that this girl is going to be shouting from the rooftops and uh, promoting the hell out of that company, whichever one it might be. Yeah, and and I think that's that's key. A lot of us, you know, in the in the real estate market here in the U.S., trust accounting is essential. So we run a, a short term or a long term property management company, and we have a real estate company, and it is absolutely it's required for us to do trust accounting inside of those businesses. When I went and we started the short term rental again, again it was like we don't need uh, we don't need to do trust accounting. So one of the things that we implemented from the day we started the company was trust accounting. Mm. I hired a team of accountants and I said, okay, I want to know exactly what funds belong to who, separate it. And although we can't technically run real trust accounting because we don't get the audits, we run it just like it was trust accounting, but it's important for the growth of the business. It is. Yeah. yeah, it is. And, and also for your marketing, for future listings to come on board, homeowners need to know that they can trust you with their money so and that you're not out there just uh you know living it up so yeah one thing you mentioned early earlier which i think is another area that we talk a lot about on here brian and it goes back to knowing the guests but is data i i think that's another area julie mentioned that having that data understanding and and i'd be curious so as you are building these relationships with these guests and an understanding that maybe in Australia, I don't know if Australia, I'm, I'm thinking about it like Hawaii. You know, Hawaii doesn't get a lot of repeat guests. They tend to be a once every kind of six years type bucket list. And I don't know if that's the, the groups you're seeing. But when you think about markets where guests are coming back a lot, it seems to me in our industry, we don't do a great job of one, collecting data on those guests. But two, we really don't have a great place to put it as far no. as a CRM that is truly like, hey, here's why they came. It was an anniversary or is a birthday or is a girl's trip or a guy's trip. Like that stuff matters for then as you're remarketing to your guests. And I feel like we just kind of remarket to them as though we've never, we know nothing about them. And it's like 10% off if you book before X date and, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on where we are as an industry because the hoteliers seem to be much further ahead on this than, say, our vacation rental industry. 100%. I, I think the hotels are all over it, recognizing anniversaries or birthdays or being able to know why people are coming on that particular visit to the area. We need to level it up. Um, Short-term mm -hmm. rental operators, whether you've got one property, whether you've got 100, uh, I think that's the area that, Certainly, I know that I could have developed further in with running my business at the time. And now uh, capturing that data, the information through the Enzo Connect boarding pass, um, I've got their email addresses. Uh, what I've now got to do is actually put it into action and um, and to start that retargeting uh, and you know, like you said, not only just offering a 10% discount if they come back, but um, but doing, you know, personalising those messages and being able to uh, say, look, you know, um, you came for your family reunion. Is there, would you be considering having one next year? We've actually got a range of properties that we can talk to you about. Uh, we're boots on the ground here. Let us help you, you know, but, but personalise those messages to our guests and, Yes, it does take a little bit of effort, and I think that's where a lot of short-term rental operators, uh, they're running so ragged at the moment. A lot I see the majority of people that I work with are running 24 hours, seven days a week, I, you know, and in that crazy um, uh, headspace that they can't even think that they would want to add to their job list or to their tasks. But what we're talking about here is something that a virtual assistant can help you with. Uh, or a, a you know a junior in the office or somebody that may be able to just take that as a task as a little marketing uh, package and then and run with it and I can tell you you're going to see great results out of that um, you're going to see great reviews as well as great booking results uh, but that's a little task that you need to get you need to add once you can I, can I always talk about working on your business, not in your business. And I think you've really got to streamline your short-term rental businesses, um, get the framework in place, get your team organized, get your systems and processes sorted, uh, 
automate everything that you possibly can in your business so that then you can work on projects like this that's going to level you up and bring you more. That's great. There's some great well, I, advice right there. And by the way, if you're listening, if you just listen to that part and you're growing your bit, like listen to that. Go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, I just that was I, good. No, I agree. And and I think unfortunately we need like another hour, maybe two or four, to keep going into some of these topics. But you've touched on something that I find to be one of those topics where not enough people ask. And it's the question about people. When you're scaling a business, when you're growing a business and you start, you know, short-term rentals, you start as a one-man band for the most part. And then you've got small teams around you, which are, you know, hopefully your really good cleaning staff you found or your maintenance team. What we don't talk about internally is how do you grow and when do you grow your internal team? And where do you start? What do you need? As soon as you can. How do you approach that? Because it is such a, you know, it was funny. I was talking to one of my homeowners today and the guy said to me, you know, every time I talk to you and Matt will say this too, you're in your truck, you're running around like lunatic doing whatever. He's like, I will give you, I've never had anybody do this. I will give you my time. What do you need help with? Wow. Yeah. And he's like, you need, my wife is an accountant. I do, he's a tech guy. And he said, I can help you behind the scenes so we can scale the company a little bit. And he goes, and I don't want to charge you anything. I just want to lend you the time. And I said, thank you very, <laughs> it was, it's the craziest thing. I said, thank you very much. But, you know, but at what point do people really start to need to take a look internally and growing the company? Because all they see is dollar signs, right? You, you want, you need to hire people that costs money. But I have a theory that sometimes that money is going to generate you more money. Yeah. And if you don't hire the right people, then you can't focus on the growth of the business. You can't think, fix the things that are going wrong. So it's actually costing you more money. How do you view that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, we could talk for hours on this and boys, you might just have to invite me back for like a series of podcast interviews. So, um, but yeah. very briefly with my own experience, I got to, well, five properties. I was running on my own independently without any other team members, but I soon realized that I was um, not going to grow if I didn't get some help. And I also faced the challenge that I didn't have any money. Like, how was I going to pay an employee to come on board and give them a job? What if something went wrong? What if there was a pandemic? What if there was, you know, something happened that I'm suddenly responsible for this person's wage? So I put into place a, um, a very unique framework, uh, like a franchise system, where I was actually giving an opportunity, a business opportunity for a hosting partner. So I looked to take, well, Glenn, a 70-year-old gentleman was my first hosting partner that I bought on. And I said to Glenn, can you, uh, can you, I was going to say cook, can, he doesn't need to cook. Can you clean? <laughs> can you use a smartphone? And uh, would you be willing to take on responsibility of five properties? You're going to do all the guest communication. You're going to meet and get greet these guests. You're going to look after these properties like they're your own. You're going to report back any damages to me, take care of any maintenance, clean, and then do the laundry. And in turn, I gave him, I was charging my homeowners 25%. I paid him 6% of that plus the full cleaning fee. Cleaning fee came in from the guest, went straight to Glenn. So he was earning on those five properties, he would earn about $700 to $800 a week. Uh, but guess what? It freed me up to go out and get more properties. So suddenly I found this great um, oh, formula that I could put into place and have these hosting partners come on board with me, take care of all the running around, but also become the face-to-face -face contact for the guests. So they would introduce themselves as, hello, I'm Glenn, I'm Julie's co-host. And he would take care of those people from where to go. Great. I went out, I started looking after, looking for more properties, dealing with homeowners. It got to the point at 50 properties, there was enough income in my business that I could employ somebody and have them on that wage that I was talking about before without worrying about something going wrong. So suddenly I've got these contractors looking after these little franchise, um, this franchise model of portfolio of properties. At 50 properties, I took on a property manager to oversee that and to help me go out and find new properties. And that is how I scaled very quickly. 
I've got a very unique model, which I actually share with everybody. Anyone who wants it, get in touch with me because I've got the model, I've got the contracts, I've got the templates, the training manuals. If, if it, I don't want people to reinvent the wheel. If it's if it worked for me, it'll work for others as well. But but it's really to answer your question as quickly as you can afford it. Get people on to help you because you need. Otherwise, you'll burn out as well. Burn That's it's not yeah. just about money; it's about burnout. And trust me, I've suffered burnout before, and no one needs to go through that. So, uh, so but now virtual assistants as well to mm. help with the the business is something that I would consider. I didn't do it back then, but I would do it now if I got to that level. So, um, so there's lots of help out there, but folks, you've just got to realize that. Don't be too precious and think that people can't do the job as well as you you can. You've got to surround yourself with people that enhance you and are better at these things than you. I'm a shit cleaner. I know that. I go out and find people that can clean and have an eye for details. So, uh, so I would implore others to to do the same. That's awesome. Yeah, it is really good. Well, and so that's what you're kind of doing now, Julie, is really helping people build their businesses in this really incredible industry. If people want to um, get in touch with you, talk to you about maybe your consulting services, obviously you've got a couple of great books that they can read um, following you. I follow you on LinkedIn. I'm sure you're on multiple platforms, but what is the best way for them to reach out and, and start a conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So my website's probably the best one because you can book a 15 minute free Zoom call with me. So just jump on a Zoom like we are now and have a chat to me. Let me see if I can help you is the first thing that I would invite people to do. Uh, So milliondollarhost.com.au. Uh, so the boys might throw it in the uh, the show notes as well, but milliondollarhost.com.au. But otherwise, look me up on LinkedIn, uh, um, Facebook, um, Instagram, uh, TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying my hand at TikTok, boys. Uh, don't laugh too hard, but I am on hey. Uh, yes, that, that is impressive. I only I only have TikTok on my phone, but I feel so old right now. Okay, uh, yeah, I've TikTok. I've just never logged in. <laughs> there you go. I'll tell you what, it's addictive <laughs> as well. But um, but also Clubhouse. Clubhouse is an app that um, I've got thousands of followers, and I had been running a regular show. I'm not sure if I will, but I am on there. So folks, keep an eye on Clubhouse because I I'm a bit of an oversharer. There's nothing off limits. I'm happy to give you any tips that I can to shortcut your success in this business and, uh, and fast track it. That's awesome. It is great. Joey, thank you so much for the time. Uh, really, really appreciate it. You, you work in your schedule around the big time difference and, and joining us today. Thank you again. Thanks guys for having me. Thanks, Julie. That's it for this week's episode of Guest X. Be sure to sign up for our email list at guestxpodcast.com. That's guest, the letter X, podcast.com. And follow us on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. We are Mr. Guest Experience, Brian Hamawi, Matthew and Matthew Loney signing off and reminding you to always create a customer experience worth talking about. This podcast is a Hospitality.fm production.